Um, let's just uh, get our mutes on. Um, Gemma, could you talk louder? It's yeah, I, uh, hold on. I'll just change my speaker. Okay, is that a bit better, Afsana? Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Well, good yeah. afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's very nice to be with you today. Uh, my name is Gemma Van Halder and I'm the Director of UNSCAP and uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today and with our speakers. Um, we're, we've joined forces today with the Asian Development Bank and I'll hand over to Arts in a minute. Um, but we, we established this cafe series back in June um, just as the COVID-19 was shutting us all down and redirecting how we produce, uh, reach out to you and um, we've used it as a great opportunity not only to share with you what's happening at the country level but also to work with our partners here in Asia and the Pacific uh, about work that um, is also underway being led by development partners. So it's a real pleasure today to bring um, to join forces with um, the Asian Development Bank and with ART and the team to talk about this topic of remote sensing data um, and its use, particularly in the area of, and I see we're in the area of agriculture, but also in the area of poverty estimation. The a few weeks ago, we had a, a data stats cafe where we heard from our um, partners in the South Pacific Secretari Secretary of the Pacific Community about the real value that re remote sensing data brings to us. Partic and they, they challenged us to think about um, the, the power here of remote sensing data is that it's at such a granular level that we can aggregate up to different regions and we can aggregate up to different vulnerable groups rather than um, having to think about how do we disaggregate data. So today I'm particularly excited to on the topic of remote sensing data for accelerating global development. Particularly excited to be uh, here with you and with the uh, with Art from the ADB, but also again to show you the power that uh, these rich data sets like remote sensing data offers for meeting the data disaggregation challenges of the 2030 agenda. So with that, I'm going to hand. Oh, sorry, just very quickly, um, if as we go through this um, cafe today. We will have time for questions and answers. Um, please do put your questions in the chat box on the right hand side there. Um, please also, we have the option here under the MS team control bar. If you're looking for the meeting chat, it's the second one along. It looks like a little chat box. Also, you can raise your hand to speak and we'll certainly have an opportunity there to bring you in. Um, and then please keep your mute um, on so that we can hear from the speakers. Um, we, we here at, the, at SCAT will also uh, mute you if, we, if you forget. Um, and if you are having trouble with your connectivity, your internet connectivity, turning your camera off can sometimes improve the connectivity. So without further ado, uh, they're my opening remarks, and I'm now going to hand over to Art from the Asian Development Bank based there in Manila to say a few words. Over to you. Thank you very much, Art. Thanks a lot, Gemma. I would also like to thank, uh, extend our team's appreciation to other colleagues from UNSCAP, Afsane, Eileen, Panita, and everyone else who helped us co-organize this session. It's a pleasure to, to join forces with you UNSCAP for organizing this um, specific session of Stats Cafe uh, this afternoon. Indeed, as you've mentioned, Gemma, the use of remote sensing data, particularly Earth observation data, has advanced significantly in the last decade. Uh, nowadays, we see a wide range of its application from environmental management, assessment of impact of disaster, and even in socioeconomic planning and analysis. In ADB's context, the use of remote sensing data falls under innovative solutions that are finding new ways uh, for us to serve and address development challenges in the region. I have a couple of slides here which enumerate some of ADB's projects that use remote sensing data, from using it as inputs in a housing project in Uzbekistan, 
to identifying strategic areas of priority for an urban development project in Armenia, to identifying parameters that can help increase climate uh, resilience in Mongolia and Tonga, and there are so many more. Um, but of course, um, I don't intend to cover the details of each of these applications and initiatives due to time constraints. But in case you're interested, I'm sure that the slides um, will be shared with everyone at the end of today's session. And you may also check an ADB publication prepared by our Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, which provides more information about these efforts. On the other hand, what we hope to cover for today's session is how remote sensing data are being used by national statistical systems to enhance the compilation of development statistics. And in that regard, we're very fortunate to have a distinguished set of panelists who will share their country's experiences on how the remote sensing data are being used for, as Jem mentioned earlier, agricultural statistics and other agricultural related activities, as well as poverty estimation. In fact, our team from the Asian Development Bank, particularly uh, the Statistics and Data Innovation Unit has worked with them on this um, specific areas. So, um, let me introduce the first presenter, um, Dr. Do Min Pong. He's currently the deputy head of the Software and Database Division in the Center for Informatics and Statistics of Vietnam's Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, of, or MARD. As a GIS expert, his work spans fields of database management, um, spatial mapping using remote sensing, geographic information system, and global positioning system. Before joining MARD, uh, Dr. Puong has worked as a project coordinator, consultant, and international expert for organizations such as JICA, World Bank, International Rice Research Institute, and the Ministry of Health, and serve as a visiting lecturer for the Vietnam Academy of Agricultural Sciences and Chiang Mai University. Dr. Puong earned his master's and doctorate degrees at the Asian Institute of Technology. So may I call Dr. Puong for um, his presentation? Dr. Puong, you have the Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you. Also, thanks a lot all of you who attend here. I can see more than 100 people now. It, it's, it's my great honor to speak today and today uh, uh, I'm gonna scan through some uh, highlight applications on uh, remote sensing and GIS for agricultural sector especially those are uh, applied in the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Vietnam so uh, again I, I am from from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development and I'm working in the Center for Statistics and informatics. So, uh, from the work nature, uh, my organization, you can see that I'm I'm quite uh, close to the work of statistic uh, data analysis and remote sensing. Uh, and next, please. Now, I, I, I want to show you the organization chart of the Ministry of Agriculture. As you can see, a lot of uh, departments and centers. But what I highlight here is. Uh, the boxes with institutes with remote sensing and GIS. Uh, since the applications of uh, remote sensing and GIS are mostly uh, implemented and applied by institutes under the ministry, there's a, there's a you know the lack of uh, organizational and root uh, operational application of remote sensing at the ministry level. And uh, the following slides will show you in detail how uh, remote sensing GIS applications apply uh, at the level of uh, remote sensing. So you can see uh, the main actors of remote sensing and GIS at our ministry, MAID, or we call it MAT. We mostly apply it at the institute level and ministry level. But as I said, at the institute level, uh, we can see some uh, quite proactive institutes like National Institute of Agriculture and Planning and Projection, or NIAP, or Vietnam Academy for Water Resources, the Institute of Water Resources, Planning, Forest Inventory and Planning Institute, 
soils and fertilizers research institute and so on and at the ministry level uh, uh, the water resources directorate of vietnam disaster management authority center for informatics and statistics and uh, department of planning so they, they they are quite few compared to the institute side next please then uh, the application of remote sensing and gis in agriculture in Vietnam, uh, mostly focus on the land use mapping, uh, soil inventory, uh, and uh, assessment, the crop monitoring and uh, crop suitability mapping and planning, water resource for irrigation and resource planning, or uh, for disaster, uh, which is uh, on uh, prevention, mitigation, and assessment of the flood, landslide, drought, and so on, and the forest, uh, it is on. Uh, um, uh, forest inventory uh, change detection in the forest or mangrove forest inventory. Next, please. So, uh, recent activity, activities uh, on remote sensing, we can see uh, some applications like the, the one with uh, 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 re uh, remote sensing application on uh, land use uh, mapping and land use change. Uh, most of the application uh, from the year 2000 up to uh, even up to now uh, focused on the land use mapping or crop monitoring in, in general. I think this situation is quite common in, in Southeast Asia country. So this one has been implemented uh, quite long ago. Next please. Then the uh, another application on the land use mapping or land cover is the rice monitoring in the Red River Delta. This application, this project uh, utilize the MODIS data, the, the low resolution satellite data for monitoring the, the rice uh, crop in the Red River of Vietnam. Uh, and this was quite long ago already. And next please. Of course, the next generation of the rice monitoring uh, is quite more high advanced. Like you see on the screen, the one uh, implemented uh, uh, by a Center for Statistic and Informatic uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture, funded by ADB. So this project uh, utilized uh, SAR data and also optical data for monitoring uh, rice crop in, in in the Red River Delta, northern part of Vietnam, including the uh, the yield uh, estimation, yield forecast for the study area. Next, please. Then, uh, recently, in the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, have more awareness on the use of application of remote sensing and GIS on the insurance factor since the insurance, agricultural insurance program uh, has been started in uh, 2015. And now uh, that program entered the second, phases, uh, second phase already. So the remote sensing based information and insurance for crops in emerging economy funded by the, the government of Switzerland uh, started in 2015 and ended in uh, 2017 for the first phase. And this phase started in um, 2019, uh, we call RISE 3. It's also working on using the SAR data Sentinel-1 for uh, RISE mapping, yield estimation, and insurance. And uh, we will announce very soon the result of this project uh, on our website. Uh, so you can have some reference on how the, the remote sensing uh, have been used for agricultural insurance. Next, please. Uh, before that, uh, also on the land use and land cover uh, mapping, uh, the industrial crop in the Central Highlands of Vietnam, including coffee, pepper, rubber, and cashew nuts, four major crops in Vietnam, uh, have been monitored and and map by the use of uh, medium uh, optical remote sensing data. In this project, uh, MAP used the spot, uh, spot data uh, to map all the major crops in the Central Highland of Vietnam. Next, please. 
Uh, can you please uh, go to the next slide? Yes. The Green Coffee project is more uh, focused on the use of remote sensing and geospatial data to, su to uh, support uh, coffee planting farmers also in the Central Highlands. The Central Highlands of Vietnam, including five provinces in the Central Highlands of Vietnam, you can see the one in, in, in the red circle of, of the map. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, project is working on uh, uh, providing daily weather information, uh, uh, the coffee mapping with high res imagery data, and uh, uh, in the form of uh, mobile applications. Uh, the project uh, is delivering information on weather, on market price, on the cultivars, I mean the agricultural advices to the farmer on how to have uh, uh, good practices uh, for coffee planting in the Central Highland of Vietnam. And this project uh, already reached to 100,000 farmers, 100,000 users. Next, please. Then uh, the mandate work of the Ministry of Agriculture is on updating the uh, agriculture atlas uh, of Vietnam. So every five years, this atlas has been updated and published in both uh, uh, hard copy, the print out, and uh, also the website, the online uh, web service. Uh, uh, you can search on the website of the Ministry of Culture of Vietnam and you can see the online uh, atlas of agriculture. Next, please. Then uh, uh, another funded, uh, one bank funded project called VNSAT or Vietnam Sustainable Agricultural Transformation. Uh, uh, a part of that is working on develop of an online GIS database for, for managing the uh, rice uh, uh, restructure and coffee rejuvenization process in Central Highlands of Vietnam and the Mekong River Delta. So this project is actually uh, kind of building up a database, a GIS database to support uh, managers uh, to follow up the, the progress of the projects only. Next, please. Then for disaster and uh, natural hazards, uh, the disaster authorities in Vietnam is actually uh, managed by the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, that's why uh, working on disaster, especially using remote sensing for disaster management and mitigation and planning as well, is quite important to the Minister of Agriculture. So there are several projects like this one, the uh, flat flat zone uh, uh, warning or landslide mapping, landslide forecast as well, has been implemented in, in the Ministry of Agriculture. Next, please. Then the Ministry is also going in line with the the government uh, climate change adaptation system. Uh, since uh, a number of works on vulnerability mapping and, and adaptation of agricultural livelihood to the change of climate has been applied. And the example on, on the screen is applied for the Nam Dinh province. Uh, this, this is one of the province uh, on the coastline of Vietnam. This one is in, in the northern part of Vietnam. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, biodiversity is also uh, touched by the ministry. Yeah. Uh, and this project uh, is funded by uh, European Com Committee uh, quite a commission a long time ago. So let's just uh, mention it again. So a various range of application uh, using remote sensing and GIS at our Ministry of Agriculture. Next, please. Uh, recently, um, the um, yeah. typhoon and uh, flood monitoring in uh, Vietnam uh, under the Ministry of Agriculture has been uh, 
more focused. Uh, the ministry uh, put uh, quite a lot of effort and and focus on on monitoring the the uh, flood area, especially assessment of the uh, impact of the flood to uh, agricultural work like like rice and other crops. So the example on the screen is monitoring uh, 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 irrigation. Sorry, this is for irrigation and the flood is next. <laughs> irrigation uh, in, in the north of Vietnam. Next, please. This is for the flood in the Mekong also. Uh, next, please. And uh, this is uh, uh, the result from the uh, rice crop damage by the flood uh, during uh, uh, the periods of uh, 2018 to uh, 2021. This, this one is still on an ongoing project managed by the uh, disaster authorities under the ministry. Next, please. And also uh, the coastal zone erosion and sedimentation monitoring is also another ongoing project implemented by the ministry. Uh, especially now, by the request of the government of Vietnam, the Ministry of the Culture developed another website for monitoring the landslide and, and coastline erosion particularly. So you can go to the ministry uh, website and find that uh, online GIS data. Next, please. The, um, this one is a landslide damage esti estimation in Nha Trang in 2018, last year using uh, planet data, uh, three meter resolution. Uh, two days after the landslide, we could monitor how many houses damage and how, um, how many uh, hectares of forest uh, uh, eroded by the, this uh, disaster. Next, please. Uh, in, in general, the, uh, we have some conclusions, major conclusion that is agriculture is the most applicable uh, remote sensing and GIS application in Vietnam. We don't find any other organizations that utilize remote sensing and GIS more than the agriculture, uh, Ministry of Culture and Rural Development. And uh, that, uh, in, in the working phase, working uh, meeting of the ministry, the Minister of Agriculture said and the remote sensing data has become an important part of monitoring, planning and inventory projects in Vietnam. That's why now the Ministry of Agriculture put quite a lot of focus and priority to the use of remote sensing. Uh, and uh, next year, 2021, we will implement several projects on remote sensing and GIS for agriculture. And the next is the use of geospatial data and techniques are still limited in space and time. We can see most of the application uh, that I have presented uh, are uh, implemented by institutes under the ministry. So at the ministry level, uh, those are having very high demand on the use of, of uh, remote sensing, especially for op operational routines. But still, uh, because the lack of uh, capacity, lack of uh, uh, investment as well at the ministry level, there is no specific um, clear specific uh, organization or body in charge of, of uh, using remote sensing and GIS to serve the, directly the ministry level. All the data now have been acquired through the institutes and centers under the ministry and somehow well, we lack of uh, connection between the ministry and, and the institutes. That's why the Center for Informatics and Statistics uh, directly under the ministry that I'm working now, have uh, proposed to the ministry to open new project uh, to serve directly some organizations, uh, some departments of the ministry, such as uh, authority of uh, natural disaster and, and department of planning. Next, please. So there are some shortcomings uh, uh, briefly concluded here. Uh, including operational routine work. At the ministry, there's no operational routine work uh, sharply using remote sensing data. For the data sharing system, we don't have any channel to share the data between the ministry and the subordinates. Um, 
the quick response to the disaster. This is one of the shortcomings. Since the disaster uh, happened, we don't have any uh, good system to respond quickly. And the use of remote sensing data is somehow not uh, uh, meeting the, the quick response demand of the ministry. We also lack like of uh, technical capacity, especially at the ministry level, uh, who are mostly working with management, managerial work, not technical work. So we need to improve the technical capacity for the staff right at the Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, uh, there are uh, some, uh, a few items like uh, major crop monitoring and geospatial analysis system that I presented here uh, that could serve for uh, planning work of the Ministry uh, this also needs to be improved very much. So this is all for the, my presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Puong, for giving us a comprehensive overview of the um, various agricultural related initiatives using uh, remote sensing data in Vietnam. And of course, for first sticking within the prescribed time, uh, that's really excellent. Um, from your presentation, I, I can really sense that the country is indeed harnessing uh, remote sensing data, particularly in, in the agricultural sector, compilation of statistics, um, etc. But what you said about um, the fact that most of the remote sensing applications in your country are focused in the agricultural sector, I find that quite interesting and I'm wondering whether there are other government agencies who have at least started exploring the potential of remote sensing data. Perhaps you, you can talk a bit more about it um, during Q&A um, and hopefully we'll, we'll get more insights about other sure. countries. Um, thank you. We will get more insights about other countries' experiences um, during Q&A. Um, before I call the next person, presenters, I'm requesting everyone to feel free to type any question you might have um, on the chat box, and hopefully we can answer as many as possible during the Q&A later. Mm -hmm. So um, the second topic, how remote sensing data can be used for poverty estimation, will be jointly presented by our colleagues from Thailand and Philippines, um, Ms. Budsara Sangarun is currently the group director of statistical analysis analysis in social sector of the statistical forecasting division of the national statistical office of thailand her work involves compiling and analyzing social and economic indicators on population and housing gender labor um, poverty education and health she is the nso focal person of the um, for the compilation of SDG indicators. Um, she earned her Master's of Science in Statistics at the Thailand National Institute of Development Administration. Ms. Anna Jean uh, Pascasio is currently a uh, Senior Statistical Specialist at the Poverty and Human Development uh, Statistics Division of the Philippine Statistics Authority. She is the Lead uh, Sector Specialist for Poverty gender and children uh, statistics. She is also one of the technical staff in charge of the estimation of the official poverty statistics in the Philippines, um, which are available at the, as well as the, the small area estimation um, of poverty, which are available at the city and municipal level. Um, she obtained her bachelor's of science in statistics and master of science in statistics at uh, the University of the Philippines. Ying and AJ, you have the floor, uh, and if may we also request that you also cover your presentation in 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Art, for the nice introductions. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I and AJ um, are going to present Mapping Poverty Through Data Integration and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, this study is based on an ongoing project by the Philippine Statistics Authority, National Statistical Office of Thailand, 
in collaboration with the Asian Development Bank and World Data Labs. It draws inspirations from recent studies uh, that use high resolution satellite imagery to spatial data and powerful machine learning algorithms to complement traditional data sources and conventional survey methods. We apply this approach with the objective of uh, providing granular statistics on poverty. Next slide, please. This is how the presentation is structured. Uh, first, I will provide a motivation and rationale behind this study. And then my colleague from uh, PSA, AJ, will briefly describe the methods and summarize the findings. Then I will conclude the presentation by providing the recommendations. Why Canada data is important? As we realize, development statistics like us recognize the challenge that the leave no one behind principle of SDG brings. If policymakers need more general information, obviously we need to collect more data. Uh, for instance, in the case of household survey, which are considered major source of socio-demographic indicator of the SDG, would need to increase its sample size to be able to meet the risk aggregated data uh, requirements of the SDG. However, the amount of resources allocated to those who produce or compile the data does not necessarily increase uh, commensurately. Next, please. Uh, the challenge for us, therefore, is finding alternative ways for providing general data without necessarily overhauling our traditional data collection system that will obviously require significantly more resources. Uh, that's the objective of these projects, jointly implemented by PSA, NSO Thailand, ADB, and WDL. In particular, our main objective is uh, to provide more geographically disaggregated property numbers than, we, than uh, what we could have if we solely rely on household income and expenditure survey. Now, let me request my colleagues uh, AJ to walk us through the basic principle of the methodology as well as our key findings. AJ, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ying. For the methodology uh, in the study, we are focusing on satellite imagery. Although um, satellite imagery provides very rich information, processing images is not as straightforward as it seems. So the main challenge in image analysis is that data are inherently uh, unstructured, noisy, and hard to process statistically. Fortunately, over time, the, the advances in machine learning algorithms had been made, particularly in neural networks, which have pro propelled the field of image analysis forward, um, opening up the opportunity to use computer processing of satellite images to gain statistical information. Convolutional neural network is a computer vision technique which is becoming more popular for such tasks. Like any neural network, um, the CNN has an input layer, which in this case is an image, which is basically a collection of pixels. Uh, previous slide, please, sorry. So uh, the first image in the slide, that's the input layer. Then we have the hidden layer, layers, uh, the one in the middle. The hidden layers are simply looking for specific patterns uh, from images which can help us predict our output. In our study, the output is the poverty rate. So basically, the ultimate objective is to come up with an algorithm such that once you feed in with a satellite imagery of a specific location, the algorithm can predict the level of poverty. To make the concept more relatable, uh, let me use this analogy. I assume that most of us have a Facebook account. When we upload a photo on Facebook, usually at the first instance, we need to manually tag those uh, who are the people in that photo. So every time we do that, we are actually feeding information to FB's um, computer vision algorithm, particularly its facial recognition um, algorithm. Um, by doing it repeatedly, uh, the computer vision algorithm is being trained to streamline the list of persons that have a similar facial feature up to a point when it can automatically identify who are in the photo. Essentially, that's what we wanted to achieve in our study, but this time we want to predict the level of poverty. Next slide, please. But there are te technical challenges before we can design such an algorithm. 
in general to successfully recognize specific features and identify what is featured in an image. An algorithm like CNN needs uh, volumes and volumes of labeled images to train on. A labeled image is one in which we already know its classification. In the context of poverty estimation, um, labeled images at granular levels are limited. Most poverty statistics compiled by NSOs are available at national, regional, or provincial levels. In some countries that use conventional um, small area estimation or SAE techniques, uh, poverty statistics may also be available at more granular um, levels, such as district level. Nonetheless, even a country with poverty statistics for uh, 5,000 districts and therefore 5,000 uh, poverty labeled image, images, still those may be considered insufficient in number for the purpose of training an algorithm to successfully predict poverty. To address this issue, a Stanford um, University study proposed a transfer learning approach by which instead of training the algorithm to predict poverty outright, it is trained to predict intensity of nightlight first. Next slide, please. The computer vision algorithms um, extract features which tend to be correlated with varying levels of intensities of night lights. Then we make adjustments so that the final predictions are poverty rates instead of night light intensity. Next slide, please. For the data used in the study, first, uh, we need uh, poverty data. In the case of the Philippines and Thailand, we are using government published numbers municipal and city level poverty rates as compiled by the Philippine Statistics Authority and Tambon level poverty rates as compiled by the National Statistical Office of Thailand, both of which are compiled using um, small area estimation technique. Um, this slide shows that the proportion of people living below the national poverty line in the Philippines is much higher compared to that of Thailand. Um, next slide, please. For the daytime imagery, here we are using publicly uh, accessible imagery from Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2. Again, it is aligned with the main objective of encouraging NSOs to start exploring alternative data sources to maximize um, budgetary resources. We think it is strategic to use satellite images that are publicly accessible when doing exploratory or case studies instead of immediately working with high resolution of proprietary uh, images that may be expensive to procure. Next slide, please. Lastly, the third primary data requirement for this study is the night lights. We are using the night lights uh, data downloaded from the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS, which provides publicly accessible Earth observation images taken at night. A cloud-free average radiance value was used to filter out the effects of fires and other transitory events as well as irrelevant background while unlit areas were set to zero. Next slide. A number of uh, analytical tools and software, many of which are publicly accessible, was used. So NSOs are encouraged to start exploring with minimal investment costs as much as possible. So we have Google Earth Engine, Jupyter, uh, Google Colab, FastAI were used in the study. Next slide. Uh, for the key findings, um, we split our data where 90% are for training set, where we estimated the modal uh, parameters and 10% for out of sample uh, validation. The results show that the CNN performs relatively well but there is a slight difference between the performance in the Philippines and Thailand, with the Philippines performing slightly better. We believe that this is potentially caused by the different night light values in these countries. Next slide, please. So adjustments were made so that our final predictions are for poverty. As you can see from these charts, uh, we are comparing the predictions with government published uh, poverty rates. In the x-axis, we have government published uh, estimates and in the y-axis, we have the AI-based poverty estimates. The results show that the root mean square error or RMSE is slightly better in Thailand, but it does not necessarily show the full picture. If you look at the scatter plots, 
uh, the predictions for Philippines are better in the sense that they are closer to the 45 degree lines line as compared to the pattern shown in Thailand. The problem with Thailand is the input data for ridge regression. The distribution of government poverty rates is quite narrow. There is a lot of variability as compared to the heterogeneity of poverty rates observed in the Philippines. This is one of the reasons why the AI-based poverty estimates underestimates poverty in, Th in Thailand. In general, however, if you look at the rankings, it is relatively consistent with government published uh, estimates. It is just that it underestimates poverty. Next slide, please. To test the hypothesis of whether the distribution of government published uh, poverty estimates is affecting the prediction accuracy of the CNN and ridge regression in Thailand, we explored um, other indicators related to income poverty rates. We looked at the multidimensional poverty index and the proportion of households owning different types of assets and durable goods, such as house and lot, house made of light materials, big screen televisions, washing machines, among others. Uh, next slide, please. The same estimation procedures were uh, performed. We re-estimated our reach regression models, but instead of income poverty rates, the data was regressed on different variables, including MPI and asset indicators, um, as, as described in the previous slide. For some asset indicators that have better variability or have more heterogeneity, our poverty estimates seem to perform much better. Next slide. We also followed a calibration technique so that when we aggregate the grid level estimates of poverty at the same level where we have the government estimates, the two sets of numbers would be internally consistent. By doing this, we can avoid confusion among users of poverty estimates. Just to illustrate the calibration procedure, um, this slide shows an example of one municipality with one estimate from government published number and more granular estimates of machine learning predictions. If we do not calibrate and we proceed with aggregating it, it will not be necessarily the same as the published. But if we introduce calibration, the machine learning predictions when aggregated will be consistent with the government published estimates. In some areas, when we do the calibrations, the difference between the machine learning and published estimates are not significant, but in other cases, there are obvious changes after calibration. Although calibration uh, changes poverty levels, the rankings within the same municipality or tambon are still preserved. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, shows the resulting grid level poverty maps for the Philippines for 2012 and 2015. Next, um, this slide shows the grid level poverty maps for Thailand for 2013 and 2015. So now let me give back the floor to my colleague Ying to wrap up. Thanks. You are muted, Busara. Uh, thank you, AJ. Uh, to summarize uh, what we have been, uh, what we have uh, presented, uh, having granular data is important. It helps facilitate more efficient resources. However, achieving uh, generality does not necessarily have to prompt data compilers to redesign existing data collection system and incur significant costs. This can be achieved by embracing the principle of data integrations. And also using publicly accessible satellite imageries, I think is a good starting point, especially for an ESO who are at the exploratory stage. Next slide, please. And for the recommendations, um, the first one, scaling up from expir exploratory study to more rigorous poverty mapping initiatives could potentially benefit from several enhancements. And the second one is going beyond granularity, means how satellite imagery can be used to forecast poverty for years when we don't have benchmark estimates. Next, please. 
uh, for uh, if you are interested uh, to check the detail of the study, you may find them uh, in the report published by ADB in collaboration with the rest of the project teams. And here's other links for the further publishes and events you may get, you may go through for further information. Uh, this uh, that's all for the presentation from I and uh, the NSO Thailand and PSA. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ying and AJ. Um, yes, uh, as Ying highlighted, it's really important to have granular poverty data because such type of information can help facilitate um, more efficient targeting. However, the challenge, especially when we're working with surveys alone, is that to produce granular statistics, we may have to increase the sample size, which is not always a practical option. Um, thankfully, as demonstrated by the methodology briefly described by AJ, by integrating surveys with remote sensing data, we can potentially um, produce data that are more disaggregated that, than what we can get if we were just working with um, surveys alone. So before we open the floor for Q&A, may I request Dr. Romulo Virola to share his thoughts about the presentation and more generally about the importance of using innovative data, particularly remote sensing data um, in the field of official statistics. So Dr. Romulo Virola was Secretary General of the former National Statistical Coordination Board, or NSCB, which uh, was the highest policymaking and coordinating body on statistics in the Philippines until his retirement. He has worked on hundreds of studies and statistically speaking articles, which are posted on the website of the formal, eh, former NSCB. He was a member of the governing bodies of the Partnership in Statistics for Development in the 21st Century, or Paris 21, the UNSCAP Committee on Statistics, and the Washington Group on Disability Statistics, among others. Um, he was also a member of the jury of the 2011 Mahalanobis International Award of the, Statistic, of the International Statistical Institute, the Friends of the Chair of the UN Statistical Commission on the Fundamental Principles of Official Statistics, uh, the International Advisory Board Group on Agricultural Statistics of the FAO, the Advisory Group of the Marrakesh Action Plan for Statistics, and the Statistical Advisory Panel of the 2012-2013 Human Development Report. He has served as consultant for the UN System, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, OECD, Paris 21, European U Union, and ASEAN stats, um, mostly for the development of the statistical systems of many countries. Among his um, recent professional involvement were on the user engagement uh, for national statistical offices, developing a statistical framework for quality of life and the measurement of the digital economy. So, Dr. Virola, I think we've pre recorded um, Dr. Romulo Virola's uh, intervention. So, Seth, if you could just. Uh, Good afternoon. Allow me first to congratulate UNSCOP and ADB for their collaboration on this forum and the authors for their interesting presentation. Within the time limit of 10 minutes, my discussion will consist of three parts. First, why introduce innovative data sources in official statistics? Second, the opportunities offered by these innovative approaches to statisticians and to statistical offices. Lastly, the challenges faced by statisticians and statistical offices as they exert efforts on these innovative approaches. Enshrined in the fundamental principles of official statistics, which was endorsed by the UN Statistical Commission in 2014, are two relevant principles. Principle one, which states that Official statistics provide an indispensable element in the information system of a democratic society. And official statistics are to be compiled and made available on an impartial basis to honor citizens' entitlement to public information. And principle five, which states that uh, Data for statistical purposes may be drawn from all types of sources, 
be they statistical surveys or administrative records. Statistical agencies are to choose the source with regard to quality, timeliness, cost, and the burden on respondents. More specifically, there is a need for granular data in accordance with the leave no one behind principle of the SDGs, which recommends that development indicators be disaggregated by various relevant dimensions, as is stressed in the first paper. And of course, more and more granular data are needed for national and subnational development planning, as well as by the private sector and civil society. However, many of these granular data cannot as yet be generated by national statistical systems using traditional and even already non-traditional data sources for a number of reasons, such as in a sufficient resources allocated to statistical offices, the costly operations of statistical surveys and censuses, and methodological and technical limitations. Actually, in fairness, national statistical systems all over the world, including those in developing countries, have been trying to produce more and more granular data. But the SDGs require finer granularity such as data for specific mar marginalized groups like PWDs and indigenous peoples. The welcome consequence is that the use of innovative data sources for development has created op opportunities for official statisticians and national statistical offices. It enhances the relevance of statistical offices to stakeholders it improves the overall quality of statistical products and services, leveraging advances in technology. It gives a chance for statisticians to expand their horizon, their skills, knowledge, and expertise. We saw today two examples using artificial intelligence on satellite images, one on poverty mapping, and the other on crop insurance. There is no reason why we could not extend the strategy to other statistical and development concerns. I find it interesting that remote sensing technology is used in crop insurance in Vietnam, as reported in the second paper, because this is one of the problematic areas in the field of insurance, especially in developing countries. And yet it is critical to ensuring that the marginalized farmers will not be left behind. It also offers opportunities as well as challenges for statisticians to pursue continuing education, to be able to cope with the increased expectations from increasingly more sophisticated stakeholders, and to cope with competition from other data practitioners who now produce and disseminate statistical indicators, which used to be the sole domain of official statistics, like the CPI and national accounts. But against these opportunities, there are a number of challenges that need to be addressed for these non-traditional data sources to serve their purpose. Need for capacity building, for developing expertise on artificial intelligence and other innovative data sources among official statisticians and possibly a paradigm shift in the training of statisticians. The need not to unwittingly sacrifice methodological rigor, even as official statisticians take some time to agree on statistical standards and methodology before they pass endorsement by the UN Statistical Commission. The need to make sure statisticians reasonably understand the theory behind these innovative tools, that they understand the whys and the limitations of such statistical tools. 
The benefits from sharing experiences amongst official statistici statisticians should never be underestimated. As organizations, it is imperative for national statistical offices to go out of the box in the delivery of statistical products and services. NSOs should not operate in silos because it makes it harder to effectively introduce data integration and other innovations in data sourcing. Within the organization, there's also a need for people reorientation to make them less resistant to change. And not only should we explore other data sources, we should do it fast for survival. We have been talking about increased use of administrative data for more than a decade now, but many NSOs, for some reason, have had limited success. In pursuing the use of innovative approaches to data sourcing, we could not underestimate the critical importance of collaboration, cooperation, and coordination among the different duty bearers as enshrined in fundamental principles of official statistics number eight and number 10. I would like to stress that the UN Statistics Division found many years ago that fundamental principle number eight on statistical coordination is one of the least implemented by national statistical systems all over the world. Lastly, there's a need to institutionalize within the national statistical system, or at least within the NSO, the innovations introduced or learned. The ADB project saw the involvement of the Philippine Statistics Authority, NSO Thailand, and the Ministry of Agriculture in Vietnam. These implementing agencies should commit to the institutionalization of the learnings gained in the national statistical system. And as a final remark, innovations in the digital economy present various opportunities for sourcing data for development. But these innovative data sources should only complement and not replace the traditional data sources, which I believe official statistics should continue to rely on. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Virola. I hope that everyone is fine, um, that we will exceed just a few minutes beyond the original schedule to, to accommodate um, questions. So let me start by asking the question from um, Ms. Irina Bernal. I think it's addressed for Dr. Puong, and she's asking whether there is any collaboration between the ministry um, and the Vietnam National Space Center and whether you have access to the Vietnam Open Data Cube. Um, Dr. Puong, if you could um, respond to that question. Sure, uh, thank you very much uh, for this question. This is one of the issue that we have addressed at the ministry level meeting, and uh, connection or collaboration between the Vietnam National Space Center and, and the Ministry of Agriculture. Not only the Ministry of Agriculture, but also other ministries uh, who are encouraged to have connection with the Open Data Cube, the data center of Vietnam. But unfortunately, um, there are some shortcomings that uh, up to now, we haven't got uh, official connection with data queues. Uh, I can list some uh, issues such as the uh, uh, the data cube uh, protocol for data sharing is not yet uh, officially announced to us. So since we are in the uh, Center for uh, Informatics and Statistics, we haven't received any uh, official protocol to connect to that uh, data cube. Uh, the second reason is data cube should be, data in the data cube that should be contributed by different partners such as uh, Ministry of Culture should uh, uh, contribute their agriculture data. Ministry of Natural Resources should contribute uh, uh, 
uh, natural resources layer to the data cube. But up to now, nobody has contributed. So data cube is almost empty. So what, what is existing in the data cube uh, is only the, the, the raw data, such as the satellite data downloaded from uh, Landsat, Sentinel, and other uh, free data sources. The uh, administration data, for example, or land use or forest cover data are not existing. Uh, we also have a satellite for Vietnam, which is called VN Resat 1. Uh, managed by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. But uh, Ministry of Natural Resources have not contributed uh, this uh, satellite data to the data cube. So uh, we will, uh, even we have connection with data cube, then we don't have anything to use actually. Uh, I, I mean the valuable things to use. So uh, I think uh, for the shortcoming time, the government should have uh, issued uh, some regulations to create a common framework uh, for partners or uh, for the players uh, in data queues uh, to, for data sharing and data contribution. That could make uh, success to the data queue, uh, especially apply uh, the, the application of uh, uh, geospace and data remote sensing and GIS to different disciplines in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pong. Um, if anyone wants to ask more questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, I have a couple of additional questions, and I think it's related to what I raised earlier. So our one colleague is asking whether, in addition to the studies presented today, are there other efforts within your respective institutions that use remote sensing data in addition to agriculture and poverty related initiatives? And can you draw lessons that are unique to each initiative? And what, what are the lessons which are common among most of those um, efforts? So perhaps if we could start with either AJ and Ying and then um, Dr. Poong, if you wish to add more. Uh, hi, Art. So for the Philippines, uh, for remote sensing uh, in the field also of agricultural statistics, the PSA has an existing partnership with uh, Advanced Science and Technology Institute under the Department of Science and Technology. Uh, the collaboration aims to uh, identify and map uh, aquaculture farms and estimate uh, area and production of major crops using uh, artificial intelligence and other remote sec sensing techniques. Uh, further, for other poverty, uh, big data related projects, aside from the collaboration with ADB, as discussed earlier, uh, PSA has also another project with ADB on the computation of the Rural Access Index for the SDG indicator 9.1.1, or the proportion of the rural population who live within uh, two kilometers of an all-season road. So uh, remote sensing uh, data and or big data have a lot to offer, but there are current limitations on its official use, including the need to formulate data <coughs> governance framework that would allow users and producers to use them in a safe, secure, and sustainable manner. Human, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Verola, human capacity and technical uh, technological resources are scarce and the need for legislation governing supporting the use of this for official statistics in the country. Thanks. Thank you, AJ. Um, Ying, do you want to add? Uh, for Thailand, uh, this is the first initiative uh, about using remote sensing. Uh, uh, so th this is the, the first collaboration with the uh, ADB, kind of the, uh, the technical collaborations. So um, we, we, we don't have the, uh, I think we, we don't have much knowledge about the uh, conception framework of the uh, remote sensing and also how to analyze the big data, uh, how to utilize big data uh, with the uh, uh, ground data. 
but um, for other agencies, but we look forward to uh, working with the ADBs in the futures. But for other agencies, we have the Geoinformatic and Space Technology Development Agency, uh, who also uh, uh, who also have the using the remote sensing for compiling agriculture sector and uh, for the disaster. So we also look forward to working with them too. Thank you. Thank you, Ying. Dr. Puang, do you, do you want to add, um, like perhaps uh, respond to the question on whether there are other initiatives using remote sensing in addition to agricultural sector in, in Vietnam? Yes, very sure. Actually, there's, there are some ongoing projects um, that try to uh, make, make this true, especially the one I mentioned before on uh, agricultural insurance using remote sensing. So the initiative started uh, in uh, actually 2012, the first phase of the project. And the second phase started in uh, 2017 and uh, 2015 and ended uh, uh, in uh, 2017. And the, the third phase now is started in uh, early 2019. So the use of remote sensing data with uh, drone technologies can allow monitoring, uh, monitor uh, rice crop at different levels from household level to, to uh, Pambon uh, district and, and province level and in the sub-national level. So uh, the project is in connection with uh, several uh, insurance company such as Bao Viet uh, in Vietnam, uh, Vinari, the reinsurance program of Vietnam, the uh, uh, Swiss Re, the the Swiss uh, reinsurance program and Allianz 3 from Germany. So uh, the framework is established by the government a few years ago and uh, uh, the goals of the project is the up applying remote sensing at different level of uh, spatial resolutions to, uh, uh, to the insurance sector. So because of uh, 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 of disaster, natural disaster in Vietnam that happened like this year for 13 storms every year. Uh, we, we think uh, it is one of the most urgent things that the remote sensing application at the ministry level can work on. And fortunately, we have uh, support from different organizations, especially the Swiss government and the government of Vietnam, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. So that uh, I think the, uh, this one will come through very soon and the, the preliminary result can be presented by the end of this year. So uh, uh, I'll check it out on the result and uh, I can send you through uh, this network so that you can make announcement to all the audience today. Thanks. That would be great, Dr. Puong. Uh, we still have a number of questions, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I'll probably just ask one more. And I'll probably address it to Dr. Virola. Um, Dr. Virola, we, we have a question. As a, uh, someone who used to head a statistical organization, what are your thoughts on whether this kind of remote sensing related initiative or more generally big data related initiative, is this something that you think in the long run would eventually replace traditional survey-based or traditional data collection approaches? Or if not, what will be the role of uh, remote sensing data or big data in general? Well, as I mentioned in my discussion, I hope that this will not replace the traditional uh, approaches to uh, sourcing data for official statistics, but certainly, national statistical offices and national statistical systems should be open and should embrace the uh, this tradition this uh, non-traditional approaches to data sourcing to uh, enhance our relevance to our stakeholders because the traditional sources cannot supply the information that is already needed by uh, stakeholders who are becoming more more and more sophisticated in their data demands because of advances in uh, technology. I, I think uh, it would be good to work towards a policy environment whereby 
um, statistical offices, uh, not just NSOs, but the entire national statistical system, are encouraged to pursue initiatives towards using non-traditional uh, data sources like uh, remote sensing, uh, uh, satellite images, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, etc., so that we can respond more to the data demands of our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Virola. With that, um, again, I really apologize for exceeding 10 minutes beyond our original um, schedule. Um, we'll be collecting all the questions that you've uh, written on the chat box and we'll link it to uh, the relevant speakers. But um, in the meantime, I'd like to thank everyone um, for, for your very active participation, as well as the presenter and our discussion, and of course, our colleagues from UNSCAP for uh, making this um, joint session uh, possible. Um, thank you very much. So if I may give the floor to Afsane or Gemma uh, for final remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, Art, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for staying online for for uh, and um, bearing with us as we didn't allow enough time for the interaction here today. Thank you again for our presenters and for ADB for suggesting this very interesting topic on re using remote sensing. I think it's our third or fourth topic at the cafe now about using earth observation and remote sensing data. So clearly a lot of interest in the region on this. A reminder to please fill in the uh, evaluation form if it, that's in the chat there and all the uh, presentations and recording will be on the website. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, it's been lovely joining you today. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Stay safe and healthy. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.